Welcome to the British Library. Thank you for coming out tonight. I'm Bea Rolat of the cultural events team here. Um, the second I got wind of this book, it became my mission to bring Fiona Hill to the British Library. Now listen to this. <clears throat> Over time, I came to understand that the opportunities from which I was benefiting were time and even generation specific. Younger generations of Brits and Americans from similar backgrounds could not replicate my success. We're going to be exploring why, and we're also going to be discovering how Fiona Hill has become such a, dare I say it, cult figure, even a meme in the US. And if you don't believe me, and you think I'm joking, just take a look at this. I don't do this for all of my guests, I should have to add. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, for anybody that needs an explainer of the visual gag, I've just revealed my T-shirt which says, Be like Fiona Hill, words to live by. Sorry, I didn't tell you I was going to do that. Um, before I welcome my speakers, I want to make sure that everybody knows about our reading rooms at the British Library, which is important because they're huge research areas with every aspect of human knowledge across the planet at your fingertips and the poshest chairs in London and they're free they're absolutely free you don't have to be a professor or doing a PhD anyone can go all you need is two forms of ID so if you didn't know that now you do please tell your friends um, back to tonight the fact that every single one of you found your way here to the British Library and got into this event is ultimately thanks to a teacher the impact that education has in our lives is, is, is almost immeasurable. It's very hard to, to, to describe. And when you think about that, then you have to wonder, why don't we talk about this all the time? Why isn't it on the news? Why aren't we all obsessed? Well, some of us are, looking at Fiona Miller. Um, and for myself, also outside of the British Library, I work with the Wollstonecraft Society. That's an education charity working with primary schools and human rights. Some of my team's in here tonight, so you might bump into them later. But onwards to tonight, and with a special welcome to our online audience, um, please do add your questions in the box just underneath the screen, um, because we're featuring a specially extended um, Q&A tonight, and we want to hear from as many people as possible. Fiona will also be signing her brilliant book afterwards. It's cash only, sadly, because we've been cyber hacked, but that's frankly boring me by now. And, and then last of all, this is, I should call this a Fiona Squared event, because um, tonight the event is being chaired by the writer, journalist, tireless education campaigner, Fiona Miller, formerly a Downing Street Special Advisor. Um, she was chair of the Family and Parenting Institute and is author of numerous books on education. Um, and she, was chair, she is chair of the Young Camden Foundation and a school governor. I'm delighted that she's governing procedures tonight. <laughs> Please join me in a massive applause for Fiona Miller and Fiona Hill. I do want to start by thanking Bee for getting this event together because I'm not, I mean, she did refer to their cyber hack, but honestly, her work has been tireless to make sure that you're all here listening to the wonderful Fiona Hill. And without her, I don't think it would have probably come together in the way that it has. So I'm assuming everybody knows something about Fiona Hill. And if you haven't read her book, I'm just going to give you a brief sort of potted history of her life. So she grew up in Bishop Auckland um, in the sort of post industrial northeast of, of the UK, going to school in the 70s and 80s. Her dad, Alf, was a miner who went to work as a hospital porter when the pits shut, and her mum, was a, June, was a midwife. And I think your life was financially challenging, but it seemed very rich in other ways from reading the book. Um, and the book, There's Nothing for You Here, Finding Opportunity in the 21st Century, comes from something her dad said to her when she was approaching adulthood about you know, leaving the North East and going somewhere else because there was nothing for her there. And the, the book is a very sort of personal account of her life story, and starting at Bishop Barrington Comprehensive School, which is one of the first sort of, you call it a nascent, struggling comprehensive school, to St Andrews University, where she read Russian and modern history. She then spent a year in Moscow, went to Harvard, 
got an MA and a PhD, went to the John F. Kennedy School of Government, the Eurasia Foundation, the Brookings Institution, or the National Intelligence Council, where she worked as a senior intelligence officer on Russia, and worked for Presidents Bush and Obama before, in 2017, going to work for President Trump as his senior director, European and Russian Affairs, on the National Security Council. And at, this was on one of the most turbulent times in sort of yeah. modern <clears throat> history. Now, you call your book from the coal house to the White House. Um, and despite being a formidable Russian expert for many, many years, Fiona came to national pro prominence when she gave evidence in 2019 to a congressional hearing in advance of Trump's first impeachment hearing. Yep. And you, you chose to use that event to talk about your own life story and your family in the opening statement. And this, I think it was a combination of her gender, her accent, her life story, led to an avalanche of public interest in the UK and the US. I think the impact was good and bad because some conspiracists yeah. decided that you were a George, a George Soros mole infiltrating the national security apparatus. But it also made you a very formidable role model. Um, and after the congressional hearings, one British paper called you the improbable Fiona Hill, which prompted letters to you and the paper asking the following questions. Had your background held you back? What did your accent say about you? If your trajectory was so improbable, how on earth had you made it from Bishop Auckland to work in the White House? Yeah. Were you just a fluke? Um, and these are all a variety of questions that have been, you've been asked all through your life, which basically go back to the how did you get here? So right. I'm going to start by asking you, take us back to Bishop Auckland and tell us yeah. how you got here. Well, as the theme um, of uh, tonight uh, suggests, I got here through education. And just exactly as B said, it was a number of interventions along the way. Actually, going back to primary school, um, one person I actually ought to give more of a shout out to than you know I do, I kind of mention in passing in the book, is the wonderfully named Mr. Noble Eddie, <laughs> who was my, um, uh, the head of my primary school. And he's still alive. He must be literally 100. And he's occasionally seen wandering around downtown with his cane in, uh, in Bishop Auckland, looking dapper. He was always very dapper. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, we'd mentioned, uh, and you mentioned, that, that uh, Bishop Barrington, the comprehensive school that I went to, was a nascent, uh, struggling comprehensive school. But my primary school, Etherley Lane Junior School, was actually a feeder school for the old grammar schools. And uh, Mr Noble Eddy, the headmaster, had basically kept up the academic standards. So I actually think when I look back that my primary school education was really determinative because I actually went reasonably well prepared to um, uh, Bishop Barrington. It wasn't all downhill from there, but it was a real struggle from that, uh, that point on. But all the way along, even though there were no resources, I mean, Bishop Barrington at the time was literally a failing school. Much later on, it had an Ofsted intervention that has been turned over time into an academy. There's a new building now, new uniforms and the whole thing. But it was initially an amalgamation of the old secondary modern and a vocational school. So in terms of facilities, it was about like one Bunsen burner in the chemistry class. That kind of made, you know, the chemistry class um, uh, intake a little small. <laughs> we didn't have a library, uh, apart from we had some books, nothing like this here. Um, <coughs> we, <laughs> we had some books that had been bequeathed to us, and they all seemed to be poetry anthologies, or, you know, kind of a really strange collection of books. Sometimes it was quite useful. I had known a lot of Coleridge poetry, mm. but it wasn't very helpful for actually trying to find, you know, the books for your courses. Mm. So there was a lot of just copying things out by hand mm. from the teacher's book. And the teachers had to buy a lot of the equipment and books themselves, as people still do, you know, today in some parts of the educational system in some parts of, uh, of the UK. So, um, you know, I think part of the, the reason that I managed to persist with the education, though, was from that classic handful of teachers that people mm. always refer to. I had a wonderful English teacher at Bishop Barrington School, uh, Dr. Marshall. He'd actually done a PhD at Durham University and decided instead of pursuing um, becoming a university lecturer that he would go back into the comprehensive schools, particularly in some of the poorest parts of the Northeast. He had a calling towards education. When I was about 13 or 14 and I was trying to figure out what to do with my O-levels at the time, and that was you know, a bit of a random choice because mm. it depended on what subjects you actually could take. Our local MP came in. Mm -hmm. uh, he was just newly elected, Derek Foster, who some of the people here might have uh, remembered or heard of, who was the chief whip of the Labour Party back in the day, um, actually under the Blair mm. government. And he had um, himself had a really hard scrabble, very difficult uh, childhood. And he had found his way through education as well. And at one point, he was the head of education for Sunderland in the northeast of England and then decided to run for MP. But he made education and trying to open up opportunity for children of his constituency 
a key factor. And he came to the school and told us that education was the key. You didn't have to be basically circumscribed or held back by your circumstances. But if you did get an education, this was a bit of a kicker here, uh, it was not just a right, it was a privilege and you had to do something with it. And I remember actually thinking about that, okay, I'll have to pick an education that I can do something with, but that was really the challenge of figuring out what that would be. Mm. But I think that that's really the kind of secret to how I ended up um, you know, here with mm. you today and mm. with everybody else uh, here as well. Mm. But the path to studying Russian was not an obvious one at all. In no. fact, Russian wasn't on, uh, on offer at the school or maybe at one or two schools mm. in County Durham, and that was a bit more tricky. But before we get to that, I mean, there were some setbacks in your... I mean, even before you got to secondary school, you got a place at another more selective I did. that you couldn't go to. Yeah, well, I mean, well, actually, about that. because Mr Noble Eddy, I mean, getting back to primary school, was um, insistent on um, ha having kids take the 11 plus until they actually phased it out. So we actually ended up being the last class of kids that took the 11 plus. And he, because of the connections that he had with the old grammar schools and also some of the, um, the private schools uh, around the area, he took the, the kids who had the top um, grades in the um, 11 plus and basically uh, tried to... Um, parcel us out to uh, various schools. And I was offered a place at uh, Durham High Girls mm. School. But the unfortunate thing was, of course, it was uh, without the fees, but my parents couldn't afford the uniform, the bus fares, the books, you know, and it kind of went on. And, and, then my, and my father got really worried that I would be the kid who got picked on. I was the kid who got picked on in comprehensive school as well, by the way. <laughs> but that I would certainly get picked on, you know, from going to the school if I was, you know, basically in the second-hand uniforms and didn't have any of the equipment and any of the books. And it just became a kind of a, a bridge too far. And I think that's part of the lesson <clears throat> that I also wanted to impart mm. in the book, that sometimes an opportunity is presented, but you don't actually have the wherewithal to take advantage of it. A couple of the other girls from school did actually go to Durham High School, and I just totally lost track of them after that. I, I, I really didn't know what they ended up doing. But then the rest of us all went off to um, the local comprehensive schools. But there was an effort to try to work with us after that. Mm. And Derek Foster's um, constituent office would follow up with the school, see if people needed any help with anything. And Mr Noble Eddy had written letters to mm. the, um, the head teacher asking to kind of keep an eye out for mm. us to mm. There was a lot of individuals in your life have made a massive difference, in a way. Individual people yeah. popped up all the way through. But there were a couple of other things that you highlight in the book. <laughs> One was this school trip you went on to Turbigan. Tubingen, Tubingen. Tubingen in Germany, yeah, Tubingen. I've got that wrong, I'll yeah. be in trouble for that. <laughs> um, so there's a story about what happened to you there, and that was quite a formative experience, wasn't it, for you? And then again, when you went, ultimately, you finally decided to try and apply to Oxbridge and you had another little setback. At the yeah, end. that was, uh, tell us those are those, those kind of things? embarrassing episodes that I'm sure will relate to, uh, for a lot of people here in the audience. So County Durham um, and the local <coughs> education authority there really needs a shout out because even in the darkest times when, you know, the, basically the economy in the region had f literally fallen off a cliff with all the mines and the steelworks uh, uh, closing down, they'd maintained their cultural budget and also much of their educational funding. And so there was opportunities to go on school exchanges. And, you know, this is the kind of height of town twinning in the 1970s. Mm. And Durham was twinned with Tübingen in Baden-Württemberg in Germany, but also a place in the Nordrhein-Westfalia, a place called Bad Oeynhausen. And I lucked out by getting selected to go to Tübingen. When I actually got there, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> this is the most beautiful. It just it looks exactly the same. I was just there a few months ago, actually, when I was spending some time in Germany. It's not changed at all, because it's basically a medieval mm. um, city. So this was a, an extraordinarily beautiful place. But it was kids from all the way across County Durham, and some were still at, at, at drama school or private schools as well. This was a kind of an open, um, basically, exchange programme. So there's a handful of us uh, who went on this. And in just the first day where they had a kind of little sort of social get-together, a few girls came up to me and said, you know, what's your name and the rest of it. And then they started asking these three questions, which just still, you know, kind of give me a bit of dread. You know, what school did you go to? And I said, Bishop Barrington Comprehensive School. Immediately a kind of slight chill and a kind of stepping back slightly. Because Bishop Barrington was notorious at this point for being one of the roughest schools in County Durham. Um, we'd had all kinds of, you know, bizarre things happening. Uh, to school set on fire and all kinds of, you know, uh, scandals around the school. And then they said, um, you know, what does your father do? And I was like, well, he was a coal miner and um, then he was a hospital porter. And it was even more a kind of step back. So, they, you know, where are you from? The Bishop of Auckland, this, what school did you go to? Mm -hmm. And I was instantly realising this wasn't a conversation starter. They weren't looking for something in common. They were just trying to kind of categorise me. And immediately they just stopped talking to me. 
And it was actually that kind of moment, you know, there's always these realisations that people have that you realise you're poor or you're somewhere in a kind mm. of a different class in a different group, and that was it. Mm. You know, here I was going to an exchange in a foreign country, and suddenly the fact that I came for this particular place, and I was the only well, one person from my school, there was one other um, guy, they didn't bother to ask him that question, I immediately got ostracised. Mm. And I spent a lot of the time thinking about this. Mm. I, that didn't happen with the Germans. They were just excited. Oh, where are you from? Yeah. Uh, you know, they, they just seemed quite excited about it. And but, then the Oxford story yeah. is another of these, you know, mm. kind of humiliating stories. So um, as the comprehensive school progressed, um, there was sort of a feeling that um, Bishop Barrett was trying to set itself up to compete with the, what had been the grammar school, King James I school in the town, and also the Catholic school, um, St John's, which was just across the road. And they regularly sent um, kids to Oxford and Cambridge or helped them to apply. They'd have one or two, you know, a year. Mm. And uh, needless to say, Bishop Barrington at this point hadn't had anybody. And um, the head teacher uh, decided that one of us from that group uh, that had gone from Otherly Lane School should apply. And nobody wanted to do it. It was kind of one of these standing in a row and everyone else steps back and they said, well, Fiona could do it. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I don't know. My mum and dad said, well, why not? <laughs> why not, pet? It'll be fine. Well, of course, we had no preparation for it whatsoever. And the, the, they got hold of a brochure. I think that somebody had sneaked off to King James and snatched a brochure to kind of show you what the exam looked like. And I remember looking through it and thinking, OK. But I didn't know what I should take the exam in. And so the head teacher said he would sign me up, but he didn't tell me he'd sign me up for a philosophy exam. And I didn't even know what philosophy was. We didn't have philosophy at Bishop Barrington. And one of the questions was about Schopenhauer's theory of the will. And I thought, Schopenhauer? Is, is he a composer? No, no, that's Chopin or something like that. You know, so this is kind of, you know, trying to go through the annals of my mind from the non-existent library about, you know, mm -hmm. what this was. And I thought, OK, he sounds German. <laughs> I've been taking German lessons. And this must be philosophy. And I kept thinking, what do I know about the theory of the will? And bizarrely, I'd, I'd, um, I'd read uh, War and Peace uh, from a, a 50 pence uh, copy of it, dog eaten from a jumble sale. And I remember that Tolstoy was always going on and on about the power of the will and free will. So I decided just to adapt what I had <laughs> taken away from Tolstoy's War and Peace and write this essay that was clearly not great. But there must have been a glimmer enough of something in it that mm. I, I failed, obviously, on the, on the basis <laughs> of the exam, but they invited me for an interview. Yeah. And, and the interview uh, was where things get really challenging and, and somewhat harrowing. Because, first of all, I couldn't afford to go to the interview, uh, but some of my neighbours had a whip round for the bus fare and then the train fare. And then they would put you up in the college, it was Hartford College at Oxford, mm. uh, for a night. So, you know, fortunately, you know, the neighbours had the collective... Uh, push for the um, the train and the, the, the bus fare. And I had nothing to wear, so my mum said she would make me a dress. And my mum had taken a dressmaking course at the local technical college. And um, nobody knew <laughs> what you should wear for an interview for um, Oxford. And my mum got this bolt of a second fabric that was whole heraldic. <laughs> and my dad said, well, I could at least stand by the wallpaper and try to, like, blend in. <laughs> so it looked like wallpaper. <laughs> And she made like puffy sleeves. And it was the 80s, remember? And there's you know, a really bizarre skirt. And I had a little bit of boots a bit like this. And then my granny lent me a cardigan that she got from Marks and Spencers. So I must have looked really strange. Uh, because normally I'd be wearing like Doc Martens and, you know, jeans and, you know, a T-shirt or something. Or, or my school uniform. Uh, so anyway, I get, I get on all this. And I, I wore the, the dress the whole way down. Not to crumple it up on the bus and the train and everything. And then when I finally get to the interview, after just much confusion and getting lost in all kinds of things, I find there's one of the girls who had been my interlocutor in Tübingen sitting oh, on God. the bench. And she and I couldn't remember her name at all because I blanked out, you know, from that awful uh, encounter, but she'd remembered mine. And she said, oh, Fiona Hill, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I thought, what am I doing here? <laughs> and immediately she started kind of making fun of me and the other girls who I'd never mm. met and I don't think she knew. And, and, and I started trying to chat along with them. And I had a very strong Northeast accent. And I could tell they didn't know what I was saying. And she said, don't worry, I'll translate for you. And I thought, she's also from the Northeast, you know, kind of, mm. okay. And she'd put on a posh accent. Mm. She didn't sound quite that posh mm. when I met her in Tübingen. Mm. <laughs> and, and then as I, um, I was called forward to go for the interview in the, in the office of uh, the lecturer, someone's leg was out. Now, I don't know whether they put it out, it was just out. But I was so, you know, basically at this point thrown off my game, if I had, to have it, had a game, I fell over the, the girl's foot and smacked my nose off the door going in. 
my granny had stuck a, a handkerchief at my uh, <laughs> the, the Marks and Spencer's cardigan. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to go hold it to my nose and I'm going in. It's like this comedic, ridiculous scene. You know, Billy Elliot, you know, kind of all yeah, on yeah. all these uh, things. And, but the professor, apparently, the doors I thought at Oxford were pretty safe. It turned out not he'd been listening uh, to this going on outside. And he turned out to be a really wonderful person. Mm. And he said, are you OK? What happened to your nose? I said, I fell against the door. I didn't rat out. I thought somebody tripped me. Um, sorry, very embarrassing. Uh, but it was kind of like an icebreak, and he started asking me about what I really wanted to do. Mm. And at this point, uh, I'd been signed up for PPE, and I wasn't really sure what this was, you know, philosophy, politics, economics. I didn't do any of these courses. Mm. So I was sitting thinking, this isn't going to go well. And he said, what did I really want to do? And I said, well, I wanted to study Russian, because at this point, I'd made this decision, I wanted to study Russian. He said, well, you know, you can't do it from scratch here. Mm. Where else are you thinking of applying? And I'd seen this amazing brochure for St Andrews, in the sixth form mm. room. There were very few brochures. Most of them were black and white. And this is the first year that St Andrews had put mm. a brochure out in colour. And I'd been flicking through, looking at pictures of beaches and you know, <laughs> old things and thinking, wow, this is nice. And I said, well, I, at St Andrews, I was you know, going to basically put on my list. And I went through a few other places. And he said, you can take Russian from scratch there, you know. He said, maybe you should think about that. And then he also said, it's a four year. Mm course and maybe you could do with an extra year mm -hmm. and he wasn't being condescending or anything besides so I just don't know who he was I could never remember his name but I actually felt like I should thank him because mm -hmm. he then gave me actually some advice it was key I wasn't going to get into mm -hmm. to Oxford but I actually felt a little buoyed by the mm -hmm. experience that this man again was actually behaving like an educator mm -hmm. and thinking that this person you know seems like they could make something of themselves but they're not going to do it mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. He didn't actually say, there's nothing for you here. <laughs> but he, he was actually suggesting to me that actually I, I, I concentrate on St Andrews yeah. and gave me lots of really useful advice. So I'm very grateful to him, and whoever you, he was. Yeah. So you got to St Andrews yeah. and you did Russian from scratch. I did. And, well, the rest is history, well, history in a way. Yeah, but exactly. one of the, I did history as well. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that strikes me about reading the book is that you get these knockbacks quite a lot you know, because of your background. And some of them are comic as well. Some of them are comic, ridiculous. but there also could be knockbacks that would absolutely floor somebody else yeah. and probably would have floored a lot of other young people. So what is your kind of secret power that means you get knocked back or somebody trips you over and, you know, even if you're wearing a heraldic dress and, <laughs> and you still get up and, and move forward I, and I think, found yeah, that but I can go and dress recently. This. We were cleaning my mum's house out and I found the dress. She'd wrapped it up in tissue paper <laughs> in a drawer because I'd never worn it again, needless to say. She was probably going to cut it up for cushions or something yeah. at some point and <laughs> got round to it. I think it's actually keeping a sense of humour. Um, my dad and um, his father and my sister, um, actually some of my sister's friends in the audience now will attest to you that they, they all had a great sense of humour. Mm. My sister, was, I was usually the butt of all of her jokes. Mm. My father had a kind of sense of humour and it was always just keep your head up and keep mm. on laughing, you know, things will work out. Mm. I mean, he, he was of the kind of view that life is full of adversity, but mm. you, you would always, you know, kind of find a way to mm. uh, get around I think it. It's, I feel it's more than a sense of humour. I think you've got, something else, you've got something else in you. You've got resilience and a drive. Well, I think my, my family did have that, yeah. actually, a lot of resilience. Mm. I mean, I talk about my mum's mum, who was the most resourceful person mm. I've ever met, actually. She could mm. make something out of nothing. Mm. And I also think that growing up in the northeast of England, um, is, is quite character building mm. because also it's very tight communities. It's not just that everything's grim up north, as people you know tend to, mm. to talk about. And there is that sign that just says the north as you kind of move out of uh, London and you kind of go up there with trepidation, wondering what's ahead of you, right? It's like, here there be dragons, <laughs> the north. Uh, I, I, I really think they should change the signs if anybody you know, has, has an in on there, you know, perhaps be a bit more directional. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there is a sort of sense, a really strong sense of community that kind of all of in, in this together. Mm. And then, you know, the fact that people in my street had a whip round for me to have the bus fare. Mm. Some of my neighbours who had a car would drive me to places. Yeah, yeah. You know, that kind of thing. You always knew that people would help you. Mm. And I do tend to think, as many people here in the audience really appreciate, that, it, you know, life is a team sport. Mm. Sometimes it's an individual effort, but it's always in this kind mm. of team context. Mm. And every single person here... Um, has moved forward because somebody else has helped them mm. one way or another mm. as well. You didn't just, you didn't do everything mm. on your own. Mm. Okay, so you get to St Andrews and I mean, you, you, you move on to this absolutely flourishing career, although I noticed when you got to Harvard, you noticed that the PPE crowd had followed you there. They did, from yeah. England. Yeah. And we're still asking you about your accent. And, and I said, how did you get here? And I said, well, I came on a plane. <laughs> Came the plane like you and, did. And I, I, I know we've got to be. I want to give the audience a good chance to answer questions. So I just, I do want to move on to the broader issues that you raise in the book. But there's something about gender as well that comes through as well, yeah. as, as class from, from your book. And I, I know it's trivial to talk about, but the, the, your clothes, the clothes issue, comes up again and again and again. It's something that women are judged on far more than men what they wear. 
Um, so you knew, obviously when you went to your Oxford interview, and then there was a story with President Trump, wasn't there, when you, there was, yeah. you arrived at the National Security Council and you were you know, a senior expert in Russia and you were invited into a meeting that you didn't expect to be going to. And he thought I was the secretary. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I wasn't dressed up like a you know, Fox News, um, remember? <laughs> well, actually, you're yeah, wearing, so you were wearing trainers. Wearing, and I was wearing trainers because yeah. I'd forgotten my shoes. <laughs> Uh, I've actually remembered some shoes today, but um, you know it, it's, a, it's a very I mean, most women know your feet yeah. hurt. You know, and I uh, my dot had been um, sick the night before, thrown up all over me all night, mm. and I had to you know kind of I just had no sleep, mm. and I, I realised I was going to be late for my first day, and I thought I was going into an orientation um, mm. session, and I put on my trainers to run to the metro, and I left my shoes by the door, and I got there, I thought, oh God, I've got my shoes, you know, I've got quite big feet. And I thought, well, oh, it'll be all right. Um, I mean, I'm supposed to be in orientation. And I'd been in five minutes. And I was pulled out and said, you need to come and brief the president on the terrorist attack. And I said, what terrorist attack? You know, first of all, I'd been up all night. And I'd been on the metro. I didn't know there'd been a terrorist attack. There'd been a terrorist attack on the St. Petersburg yeah. metro. My first day in the office. And they said, and I thought, what am I going to say? And then I thought, oh, hang on a sec. It's... Putin's hometown, St. Petersburg. There's not been a terrorist attack in St. Petersburg before, thank God for general knowledge. And I could at least say to the president, well, this will be personal for Putin. Um, it's, uh, it's his hometown. Perhaps we should just you know, go straight forward mm. to uh, just a straightforward condolence. Mm. And I thought, well, I've got your shoes. And um, I asked the woman who was coming over for me, what size are your feet? Uh, and they were a size too small. And it's like Cinderella, and, you know, the yeah. sister, I was like trying people's shoes on. And then eventually, um, McMaster, HR McMaster, who's the national security advisor then, he said, well, you haven't got your shoes? And he went, oh. it's like, but this is a man who'd, you know, stared down a tank, you know, a regiment in Iraq and beat Kandahar and all these kind of things. He said, well, worse has happened. You know, so he just swapped me and he said, just stick your feet under the chair against the desk. And you just don't, he, he won't even look at you, he said, which was true, he didn't even look up. So I've got my feet stuffed against, you know, the resolute desk and thinking, God, I'm in the White House and I've got my trainers on and I'm trying to hide them. And anyway, Trump never looks up and I thought, oh, I, I, I delivered my little spiel. He calls Putin, says, it's a, the first terrorist attack, you know, in your hometown. I know this would be very personal for you. Putin, you know, makes some mumbling noises and that's it. And I thought, success. It's a great start. And then Ivanka Trump comes in. And she sits right next to me. And, <laughs> and she's, she's wearing different... heels that are about this high. And she's wearing some diaphanous, flowing white dress. And she just looks at my trainers and looks at me <laughs> and looks at, um, and looks at my master. And my master said, let's go. <laughs> well, that wasn't before, that was after you'd been asked to take the notes. Uh, that was the next time. Oh, so it, the next it, time. kind of the next time I went in, I'd been, you know, kind of properly introduced yeah. this time, but he thought I was the secretary because you take notes as the senior directors in these jobs. So, mm -hmm. you know, in many respects, you are sort of a glorified secretary. And Trump was of the view that everyone was the secretary, secretary of state, secretary of defence, <laughs> 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 secretary and secretary pool. You know, so it wasn't all that um, extraordinary. But, you know, I, I thought I was going to be asked to speak about Putin in the phone mm -hmm. call, mm -hmm. and I'd made all these clever notes about <laughs> things I was going to say. And he said, he said uh, and I just heard him saying, well, can she do it? And I thought, she, who, what? what? And uh, um, Ivanka was in the, um, uh, in the Oval Office again. I thought, well, it can't be she. And I thought, is he talking to me? And then he says, hey, darling, are you listening? And I was like, whoa, <laughs> oh, my God, it is me. And then everyone's looking at me. I mean, nobody helped me out. And I thought, what does he want? And I got that deer in the headlights look. This was not my best professional moment. <laughs> and uh, Trump saying, you know, going out and typing the press, um, statement. I thought, typing the press statement? Is there a typewriter? You know, it's not, uh, the whole kind of, my brain is whirring, thinking, what am I doing? It's like second week on the job. So I kind of get up, looking really confused, and walk towards the door, and then Ivanka thinks I'm being rude, and kind of apparently complains about me that I, because I didn't know what I was doing. Mm. And I, again, I didn't realise he was talking to me. And then after that, it was kind of a bit disastrous for a week or so. But I was actually taken aside by um, one of the uh, other women, very senior women who worked there, and said, look, we'll try to reintroduce you again. Just don't wear the same dress. <laughs> because he will never remember you, but he'll remember the dress. <laughs> and I actually had to have my husband go into these flash sales in the evening and find me dresses so that I could have a different dress every time I might potentially be going into the Oval Office mm. so I could just be reintroduced over and over again you know, yeah. as a different person <laughs> in a different dress so he wouldn't hold it against me the time before for the sneakers or, or being the secretary. Well, and I'm sure absurd. that didn't happen to the men. Utterly absurd. Yeah. No, it didn't. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was, but it was absurd. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to move on a bit to the other theme of your book, which is about the parallels you found. This is a bit more serious than the clothes, but I had to raise the clothes. Between you, the community you grew up in, 
com left behind communities in the States and in Russia, and particularly through meeting your husband, Ken, and getting to know his family and your in-laws. Um, so if you could say a little bit about Ken, and also just the thing, oh, I, when I was ticking the corners of the pages while I was reading, I kept going back in my notes, and it said transport, 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 geography. It is fascinating how much of this story about education, social mobility, etc., isn't only about what schools do. It's about, in, in your account, it's about residential geography, the digital, digital divide and transport, almost as important as education in your account of your own life. No, that's very true. Um, and I just um, wonder, you know, how you feel whether schools can really overcome these things on their own or whether this is really a much broader issue if we're going to give everybody else the same chances that you did. Well, I think it's a much broader issue. And, you know, as I said, I mean, in the book, I, I draw these parallels between the kind of deindustrializing, declining, you know, places of Russia that I saw uh, really mirroring what I'd seen mm. in the northeast of England, mm. uh, and also in the United States, and realizing that all of these things were intertwined. Mm. Now, if you're in somewhere like Russia and you want to go to opportunity, you're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of miles. You know, so if we think back to you know the the, the supposed Norman Tebbit mm. statement that people mm. should get on their bike yeah. and look for work, whether we really said it or not, but it certainly stuck uh, to him. If you're you know, thousands of miles out in Siberia, you're not going to get any bike and get anywhere in mm. particular. And also it's the same in the United States. Mm. And um, my husband's family, um, his father had grown up as the oldest son on a farm in South Dakota. And the nearest town was miles away. Mm. And his father dropped dead in the fields mm. um, of a heart attack. And uh, my husband's father had been the one who was trying to run the farm at the same time. And he also wanted to have an education. And American education had expanded after World War II with the GI Bill uh, for, you know, servicemen who'd returned from the war, but also then more broadly for, you know, it was mostly men, younger men. And um, Ken's dad then in that, um, you know, kind of period of the 1930s, he was almost exactly the same age as my dad, in fact, just mm. a year or so older. And in the kind of 1940s and into the 50s, wanted to basically get an education. And he hitchhiked from the farm to the nearest um, college, which was Wesleyan College in South Dakota, in a very small um, school. Back and forth, so we could manage the farm at the same time. And I just couldn't get the, my head around that, actually, that he was basically hitchhiking and managing mm. the farm, and just these vast distances. Mm. But he's got this amazing story that he eventually gets um, a degree in um, sort of food sciences applied chemistry. He ended up with lots of patents and, and, and helped to invent shellac, that strange, <laughs> you know, kind of greasy stuff you put around apples. Yeah. It was kind of a very um, odd thing. So every time I see a slightly waxen apple, I think of Mr. Keene mm, and yeah. his, uh, his uh, breakthroughs in shellac yeah. uh, for, uh, for farmers. But he got his first job off the back of a cereal box. Mm. because he didn't know himself how to go about getting a job after he got his degree. Mm. And he was sitting, literally eating Cheerios. And he sees the address of General Mills, uh, the, the company that made Cheerios, and decides to write a letter saying that he was a young farmer who got this degree hitchhiking backwards and forwards uh, to uh, college. Mm. And he wanted to help farmers uh, have additional products, more value added to their uh, uh, products. And he'd been, um, uh, he'd got a degree as a food chemist. Mm. Would they give him a job? And they gave him a job. Mm. He didn't even go for an interview. They gave him a job. I mean, it's one of these crazy mm. American, only in America stories. Mm. And so then uh, they move across the country to all these different places in General Mills. My husband's one of 12. And all of their kids went to school on Pell Grants, which mm. was the expansion of, of assistance for people also first generation going to college or people from impoverished backgrounds, because you can imagine with 12 kids and Mr. King wasn't making an awful lot of money. Mm. And they all had these great breaks also uh, through education, and I ended up meeting my husband, who also got a scholarship, as I did, to go to Harvard, and he's my next-door neighbour. It took a while for us to kind of grow on <laughs> each other, but he's literally my next-door neighbour in, um, at Harvard. So you brought the same, kind of, from the same backgrounds, but across the pond and... Yeah, and also one in a very remote agricultural yeah, area, yeah. and I was always kind of struck that they really went nowhere because they couldn't get anywhere, and you couldn't, like, drive the tractor, you know, down the road to the nearest town. They didn't really have a car, and, mm -hmm. you know, when you were on the farm, you were really stuck, and I kept thinking about that. And I remember once getting my parents and, you know, my, uh, my in-laws together, and they were kind of swapping these stories. It was fascinating listening to them because my father had been limited in how far he could go by how far he could cycle mm -hmm. in terms of finding a job after the mines closed. Mr. Keane had, you know, eventually got a job and moved all the way, you know, kind of around the country. And my dad had ended up, um, his mobility was eight miles away from where he'd grown up mm. because it was just that limitation mm. of distance. And, of course, there wasn't much, many jobs you could get from mm. the back of a cereal packet mm. in northern England uh, back in the That's 1960s. Yeah. But you feel very strongly, I mean, about 
the fact that other people, you, you feel that you're still the exception to the rule. And I think we have some head teachers and teachers in the audience, and they, I hope, will, will say something about their own personal experience of this, how easy it is for somebody from your sort of background to do the things that you've done. Um, and your book is a bit of a rallying cry for change at a time when you say, I assume talking about America, that anger and hopelessness exists amongst, you know, it's even amongst graduates now. You know, we've had the levelling up, but the disadvantage gap is still suddenly wide. We've had COVID, we've had UN special rapporteurs coming here and commenting on the poverty in this country. Yeah. What, 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 what do you feel are the solutions then? Well, look, they're, they're multi- You put some, yeah, you, the end of your book the has idea. seven or eight ideas about things. Well, you talk about a sort of Marshall plan for social mobility to get people from those communities the same opportunities. Yeah, I mean, you've got the kind of larger scale yeah. um, issues, and then, but you've got a lot of things that we ourselves can do. Um, you know, I think that the, the, for me, the power of mentoring, mm. people just paying for my bus fare. Um, you know, it's actually something I'm trying to do with the book. Mm. Um, the money from the book, I'm going to, you know, I already am putting it into hardship funds for students and internships and things yeah. that I wasn't able um, to oh, do. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. So, um, you know, trying to get other people to think that these are things they can do as well. Mm. I mean, also, some of it is peer-to-peer. -peer. I mean, there are a few of my friends here from St Andrews and elsewhere who, you know, just actually knew a little bit more about things than I did and actually mm. gave me advice. Hey, you can apply to this. Did you know yeah. about this job? Or did you know about this internship? And these are things that you can do. Give people a bit of career advice. Uh, just give people a chance who come mm. from um, a, different, uh, a different background. And also, we need, uh, as I said, an all-of-a societal approach to this. Uh, I, I think you know, we have to just recognise also that one size doesn't fit all. My dad actually became you know, relatively well-educated over time. I mean, he left school at 14, had no qualifications at all, didn't even take the 11 plus because his parents thought, what's the point? You know, you're going to go down the coal mine. Um, I mean, you know, who knows you know, how mm. it might have turned out, but they didn't even give him the chance to mm. do that. But he did get the chance through the Workers' Education Association and the Durham Miners Association you know, to basically get education as he went on. And you know, by the time he was a, an older adult, he was actually pretty well read mm. and you know, reasonably you know, well informed. You know, I, t I mentioned my mother taking this dressmaking course at the, um, the local technical <laughs> college, but she was trained as a nurse and you know, um, there was kind of opportunities you know, for her at age 16 to, she was one of the first cohorts of midwives in the NHS. Mm. And you know, that was kind of a way of, uh, of pushing forward. But if you think about the societal benefit of education, I think we need to rethink and not just to see it as an individual um, benefit or, or kind of something that really is only for individuals to sort out for themselves. In the United States, there's been a, um, a, quite a bit of research recently by uh, Angus Deaton, who's originally from, mm. uh, the, uh, from Scotland, mm. and Anne Case at Princeton University, they won the Nobel Prize for the work that they did on the deaths of despair. And they've recently shown uh, basically how much uh, mortality rates are linked to education and life expectancy. And there's at least a 10-year difference between uh, or the life expectancy of people who have a two- or four-year college education in the United States and some, um, uh, I think, parallels here in the United Kingdom and uh, those um, who do not. And it's widening all the time, so it's kind of a scissors um, moving outwards. Now, there's, a, diff there's a, a series of different theories about this. They actually think that it's not just the, the college education, but the fact that, uh, and then how people might think about their health and their well-being, all the various things that they should do. But it's also because we've got into this knowledge economy where the sorting for getting a job is really about whether you've got a degree or not, or some kind of qualification, just like my dad experienced you know, back in the day. So they're also advocating that we should start to think about different forms of education, lifelong learning, adult education, the further education colleges, and also giving people the opportunity to um, be educated and go to college, uh, technical college, vocational school and university, mm -hmm. but also get work experience. Mm -hmm. So they've only just started in this inquiry themselves now. And I think that we need to have a national debate. And I know that um, Joe Johnson is somewhere in the audience because I saw him on the way in, and we were part of um, a discussion at Ditchley uh, park out in Oxfordshire a year or a couple of years ago where he made a comment about education being a UK superpower and that kind of struck with me because if you actually look at the UK and the United States we were, were together uh, basically the pioneers in education. The United States set up even during the Civil War in the 1860s through into the 1890s these public land grant universities that's Michigan, Ohio, you know, Wisconsin, the big state universities. And their goal was to have mass education as well as specialised education in engineering 
and in um, agriculture. Mm -hmm. So that was a kind of a mini version of one of these that my father-in-law went to. And they remain the most affordable education and, uh, for uh, people in uh, the United States. And they do a lot of full-on grants and uh, subsidization for first-generation students. You know, I spent six months in Germany, and in Germany, an education's free. Uh, and I mean, that really makes a huge difference because the, the thing that worries me the most is how much getting into debt puts people off. I would absolutely not have gone to university if I'd gone into debt. We had a great-grandfather who died in a debtor's prison in Durham, and everybody would talk about, oh, great-grandfather Henning <laughs> who died in the debtor's prison, and so, you know, could not possibly go into debt. And, you know, that kind of barrier and that uh, kind of thought about, you know, what might happen would really put a lot of people off. Mm. And in Germany and China and all kinds of other countries, Canada, people invest in education because they see it as being of societal benefit. It's not to say that you wouldn't have, you know, some kind of modification to this. We need to have a serious discussion about it. But we're clearly in the United States and the United Kingdom now lagging behind where we could have been. And think about all of the elites of the world that are educated here in the UK and the United States. There was a recent report, 50% of the world's elite has passed through either a UK or a university, uh, or a US university. And many of them are paid for by their governments. I mean, when I was at Harvard and I was getting a, a major scholarship, uh, the, the, the government of Kazakhstan, the government of China, many other European governments were paying for, you know, some of their best students uh, to study there. Mm -hmm. And the big private institutions like Harvard actually can give everybody mm -hmm. um, uh, a basically a free education. So for many people here in the audience, you know, who are advising some of their um, students to think about university, think about applying to Harvard uh, for undergraduate. Um, if, if people get admitted, they will get a full ride. And that's an irony, right? I mean, it might be easier for people to go to Harvard and then it might be easier you know, to go to UCL, for example. Well, I think that's a very good note to open it out to the audience who've been um, asked for their views just now. I can't really quite see any of you because of this light, but um, yeah. I know we've got some heads here and I think... You, Sarah? Yes. yes, I've had some communication with you. Sarah, please ask the first question. Say, please say where you're from and what you do. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sarah Bone. I'm the um, Ask School Rep for Yorkshire and Humber, as well as being the head teacher at Headland School in Bridlington. Um, so first question from me. Um, within our context, coastal and northern, um, the socio-economic challenges being faced by our community are rapidly increasing. For example, 110 people are living in tents, not by choice, um, between January and March of this year. That compares to 25 in the whole region in the same period in 2021. In this context, there is only so much schools can do to effect positive change for our young people. Living in extreme poverty with no access to hot water, heating and food, it's a daily occurrence. To what extent do you think the government needs a holistic and interconnected strategy around improving and funding all services around young people? And what do you think the key priorities outside of education in Northern England could be to potentially positively impact children in our school communities? Thank you, Fiona. No. Okay, have we, have we got any other... I'm sorry, I'm just struggling here with the lights a bit. So, um, um, I'm going to ask my colleague, Savan, yeah. please can okay. we bring up the house lights so that the audience is more visible? Sorry. Thank you. Can I quickly put up any hands here of people who are in the education world? Okay. Uh, lady there, gentleman at the back with his hand up with a pen. I'll take you in, in threes, so, yeah, I'll come back to you, promise I will. Yeah. Uh, say who I'm are, afraid please. my question won't be about education, actually, it's more about uh, political kind of situation and things. I'm Russian, I've been living here for over 20 years, I'm a doctor, initially degree in Russia. I mean, that's one point you might actually point out in Soviet system, the education was free, including higher education, yeah. and it's pretty good level and very comprehensive. But my question is, so having such a varied experience uh, on the various levels. Uh, one, who out of modern political figures you would feel like worth looking at and supporting? And in relation to that, how do you feel about the possibility of Trump get, uh, winning the next election? Yeah, he saw a big sharp intake of breath there. Let's <laughs> hold it for a while. Okay, then we'll come back to that one. And then finally, yes, the gentleman in the back. Yeah. 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 Oh. So please say who you are. Yeah, you with the mic microphone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry? It's about education. Oh, okay, yeah. Can you wait until there was a person on the microphone? That yeah, we'll, we'll, part, we'll bring the microphone down to you in a minute. Yeah. Wait for the microphone. Thanks. Yeah, hi there. Um, my name is Andrew O'Neill, head teacher at All Saints Catholic College um, in Labrook Grove. I suppose want to know a little bit more about the, what you think about the 
British education system specifically. Um, the, your book talks about you being the improbable Fiona Hill. Um, how do we reduce that probability in the UK and create more Fiona Hills? <laughs> there are actually there's a Fiona Hill in here as well. <laughs> so there's a few of us with cloning. <laughs> okay, we've got three very different questions yeah, there. One about yeah, the, I'll, the I'll, co context yeah. in, the, in the coastal towns, which is something that I know everybody in education policy is always very worried about. One about um, for the ghastly possibility of Trump coming back, and one about the British education system, how it looks from your point. Yeah, and they're kind of th these are really you know very much uh, linked together because I mean I think as, as you laid out here that I mean the schools cannot possibly tackle uh, the poverty uh, that exists in so many of the regions, and you know part of the reason that my school was struggling was because of the poverty in the town, the sudden you know basically a drop off of uh, employment. You know, from 1981 onwards, pretty much every business uh, around in Bishop Auckland closed down and or nearby, Constant Steelworks, the Sheldon Wagon Works, the last of the coal mines, you know, just even before we got into the miners' strike. A lot of the industry had been in decline beforehand, but that was kind of, you know, the, the real drop off a cliff. It was quite like shock therapy, uh, to be honest, in, uh, in Russia in the 1990s or that what happened also in um, East Germany. Uh, in the, the same time free period. So it's just this abrupt shift. And of course, coastal towns had the deindustrialization, the decline of the, the fishing industry, the ports, and then everybody going off to Torremolinos instead of uh, Torquay or, you know, kind of uh, Benny Dorm rather than Bridlington uh, on their uh, vacations. And so even more you have uh, this shift. I mean, there's also, I mean, frankly, the, just the whole structure of the system in the United Kingdom, which is very different from the United States or Germany, where I've been spending the last uh, six months taking a look at, the, you know, some, also the education and other systems there, because we had a hyper-centralisation, I would say, um, of um, finances and authority uh, in the 1980s as well. So, I mean, I talked about the local education mm. um, authority in Durham, and their you know, kind of ability, particularly in the 1970s, to keep their cultural um, uh, budgets alive. But by the 1980s, that becomes very difficult. Because what is it, just between about 5 and 6% of taxes uh, are actually kept uh, by the local authority. So that's a problem in itself. Because in the United States, you've got, um, obviously, the states and the cities, the municipalities have a tax um, levying authority. And they can also make a lot of decisions about how educational money is spent, which is something that you can't really do in the United Kingdom. And in Germany, it's very much the same as well. They get a lot of infusion from um, the, the state or the federal government, the national level uh, money, but they also are able to you know, set um, goals themselves and to, uh, and to raise money. And so, I mean, that in itself, uh, the lack of uh, funding, of, of poor tax base, uh, you know, over um, time, you know, so many hits the economy, uh, the um, austerity uh, measures after uh, the 2008-2009 financial crisis hitting things even harder. I mean, that's when you've got the UN mm. you know, coming uh, mm. to look at poverty. But really, it's kind of multi-generational problems. Um, I know I have people that I went to school with who are my age, you know, in their late 50s, who never got a job. Their kids didn't get a job, and their kids have not got a job because they're in, um, you know, basically the council estates where all of the jobs kind of disappeared and they're not able, they don't have the mobility, the physical mobility, they can't afford a car, the bus routes have been cut off to be able to get there. But we had kids walking to school because the bus routes had been uh, paired back maybe, you know, three or four miles, you know, in all kinds of uh, weathers. So I think, you know, exactly as you laid out here, there needs to be a holistic approach. Um, it's tied to, um, you know, basically the patterns of um, employment. It's tied to how can you give mentorship and uh, support, uh, not just to kids, but also to their families. And there was two programs that, that I went to look at in Germany that were very interesting. In the rural region, they've got this kind of basic professional mentorship program um, that's uh, tied to the local university system where they have trained mentors who go into the schools to work with kids from underprivileged backgrounds who are quite, you know, kind of capable academically but have all kinds of problems. Maybe they're in a caring situation where they have to look after family members um, or their uh, family are, are very poor or they've got, you know, some other kind of barriers there to being able to pursue their education and they try to work with them in small groups or one-on-one. -on -one. That's quite expensive. Um, and it's kind of funded again by the local authorities. But then there's another group called Arbeitkind, which is nationwide, 
And they try to pick up all the kids, not just the academically gifted, but they try to actually set up volunteers of mentors, um, you know, basically countrywide, and they're basically getting a lot of traction because it turns out that there's a lot of people in the German system, high levels of the government, um, who also are from first generation uh, going to college. But the whole goal is to try to prepare people for college, not just for other um, educational opportunities. And I was thinking, you know, particularly at the back of the book, that there's kind of some of these ideas that you can pick up on. I went to Germany after I'd done the book, but it was more about how could we create these kinds of networks, getting back to your question about, you know, creating more people who can, you know, move forward to these opportunities. How could, we can all do it. Uh, so some of you are already doing it. Um, I'm trying to kind of pay back, trying to meet with as many um, school groups as I can. I do a lot of Zooms, you know, basically um, civic organisations, trying to encourage people to just sort of think mm. about how you can engage with someone. All of us can go back to our old schools. Uh, we can, um, you know, basically reach out to kids and try to help them. I try to, you know, do as much as I can, connect people with other people. Because it's also giving people a kind of sense uh, of um, a pathway forward. But then you also got to think, as I'm trying to do with the book um, money now, you know, how can you actually set up these hardship funds to give uh, kids a chance? I mean, if my neighbours hadn't given me the bus fare, I would never have gone to the, the interview. I'd never have had the professor who told me to <laughs> then apply to St Andrews. But there were many times when I just simply didn't have mm. the funding to do something. And we need to sort of think about that. The schools need to have uh, the support uh, for teachers, because teachers can't be everything. But maybe within the school system to have these mentorship arrangements and you know, Germans are already starting to do that. And I know a lot of schools do it already. So I have gone back to my old school, which is now Bishop um, Barrington Academy. It's part of a network and they're trying to create all of this too. So I can see some real signs of progress. But as you've pointed out, there's still real pockets of deprivation in uh, the uh, UK that are really, you know, for a large part, untouched. And so we really have to have interventions. But it really also depends on devolution, you know, of authority to local education authorities and also to local governments. I know in the northeast now there's the discussion about creating a combined mm -hmm. devolved authority, but we're going to have to think about this more broadly, you know, across the rest of the country. Thank you. Uh, but not an easy fix. In terms of um, Trump coming back, I mean, I, I did have the inward shudder. Unfortunately, there's a very strong possibility of him coming back. And so there are an awful lot of the things that, you know, I'm even talking about here where there's been a lot of attention being paid in the United States too about education. You know, there are many people around uh, Trump and others who are actually denigrating and talking down education. You may have seen Ron DeSantis, you know, for example, who um, is the governor of... Um, uh, Florida, I mean, you know, I, I pause for a moment because it's already hard to think of Florida as such a nice sunny place to be uh, in such a dark spot at the moment. You know, it's, it's really Florida. And it may be that actually Mickey Mouse and Disney will save us from a lot of this because they're in a fight with Ron DeSantis over you know, his uh, various attempts to intervene in the education system. I mean, literally um, trying to turn um, uh, teachers and parents against each other. You've probably been, it sounds very reminiscent of the Stalin era. Um, in the Soviet Union, where parents can denounce teachers for picking particular books, or students can, you know, taking books off the curriculum, attacking libraries. You know, education at all different levels in the United States has been under attack, and I'm afraid would be, you know, more likely to be under attack under Trump. And there's all kinds of other issues that would be extraordinarily um, problematic. So, um, you know, the election or potential election of Trump probability? Um, probability is, um, is? it's better than 50% at this particular moment which should okay. give all of us pause for thought I'm going to come back to how do we get more Fiona Hills at the end but anybody got a slightly more optimistic question <laughs> yes gentleman there with the glasses and, and we promised you a question too uh, one two is the the third question? I think it was in the green jacket that we yeah yeah, yeah you're, you're getting a mic yeah, now so. okay young lady there with a hand up with the glasses or both of you, we'll get take two quick, quick questions from you. Okay, who's going first? Yeah, okay. Um, hi, I'm Tommy Gale. I run Inside Uni. Oh, there you are, Tommy. Yeah, sorry. I hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we're an organisation that helps get children from state schools into top universities by peer-to-peer -peer work. And Fiona kindly mentioned us in her book, um, which I was listening to in the car, and it was a complete surprise, so I nearly crashed. But that was <laughs> <laughs> a really nice surprise. Um, and um, unfortunately, lots of the stuff that Fiona's talked about, about her own experience of the Oxford interview being quite an alienating and difficult process, I think is still the case. And you kind of see that in lots of the statistics about state school versus private school admissions to Oxbridge. Um, so I was interested to know uh, when you 
when you mentioned about um, students going to America um, as actually a more realistic option for them with scholarships. Is that, that's been something we've been seeing a lot with the students we work with, that they feel more comfortable to go to America than 10 miles down the road. Um, I guess just interested to know what could our universities be doing better to be more inclusive and to get more children from state schools coming in? And is there anything that we could learn from America and perhaps other places like Germany with their universities and, and how they do it? Okay, thank you. Let's, should we take the next question? So we can, yeah. Uh, just to follow up what that gentleman's saying. Yeah. One percent of the population in this country go to. Sorry, please, can you talk into the microphone because people are listening online. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, one percent of the population of this country go to uh, Oxford, Cambridge. Twenty-five percent of judges are chosen from that one percent of people. But my question follows on from the gentleman down here about education. Um, me and a few friends, John Burko, Andy Burnham, yeah. uh, Greg Dyke, we've got a bill going through Parliament to get rid of the 11 plus. Do you think this is a good idea? Very good question. Yeah, it is a great question. Ladies, here, here you are. They're going to share a mic and ask question each. <laughs> Put your hand up. Put your hand up, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jasmine. Then. No, I'm going to come to this side of the room then. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Chloe, and um, I really appreciated this, this the lecture. Um, you've talked a lot about systemic barriers, such as gender, class, access to transport. Um, I grew up in Ohio. Uh, my grandparents were farmers. Um, I really appreciate your, your thoughts on this topic. Um, but I also came to London by way of Belfast. Uh, to study migration. So I'm very interested in intersectional links between migration, mobility, citizenship, and educational outcomes. Um, I was wondering what parallels or maybe contrasts you see between the US and the UK in terms of race and citizenship and educational outcomes. Um, the US, of course, has quite a specific history with segregation in schools, including my own community um, in Ohio, and there are tremendous regional discrepancies, West Virginia being right on the outskirts of DC. Right. I'm uh, just curious about your thoughts on that. Okay, yeah, thank, you. thank you. And your friend's got a question? Um, no. 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 Okay, <laughs> okay, that's great. So we've got inclusion in universities, the 11 plus, and the specific American... Well, we talked, I touched a bit about geography and transport. And yes, yes. And, and the race issue issues. comes through in your book, which you think is more powerful in a way in America. Than uh, in America, um, and as um, you've just pointed out, I mean, it is a very important uh, factor. Um, in, in the United States. But getting, um, you know, first to um, uh, Tommy and um, his question, I want to give Tommy another shout out, not just um, in the book, uh, because I read about um, what Tommy and his uh, uh, colleagues and uh, friends uh, from university were trying to do um, in an article and then, um, you know, heard them mentioned on a, a radio program that I was listening to. And I thought, God, if only Tommy had been around when um, I had uh, got this opportunity to, to go down to... Um, uh, to Oxford for an interview because what uh, Tommy and um, his friends from university were trying to do was sort of uh, be basically guide people through the process. That is, it's like a maze uh, for people who are not already in the system. And just like a maze, there's all these dead ends and, you know, sometimes you just need some signifying to, you know, turn around and not just keep walking into the bush and not be able to, you know, find your way out. And I was just really um, intrigued by what they were doing. It was grassroots. It was just students doing this. I mean, eventually you got the... Um, Oxford and then the Cambridge um, uh, bureaucracy and the sort of system to accept what they did. It was very difficult. It was all on a shoestring. It's actually the same what the, uh, the group in Germany, Arbeitkind, did. It was also set up by students who were the first generation going to German universities. But again, German universities are free, so there wasn't the kind of you know, financial aspects um, of, uh, of this. And they also set this up. And I know that you've been trying to expand this out to other universities. Because it's not just, you know, the 1% of uh, people going to Oxford and Cambridge. I mean, the United States, in fact, I think there's uh, kind of 12 universities in total, which the, the, the whole elite, uh, you know, end up going through, that, you know, basically uh, run the country. It's all the Ivy League and you know, a handful of others, just like the Russell Group um, here in uh, the United Kingdom. And, you know, it's really kind of a question about how you can widen access. Now, part of this is also financial. So Oxford and Cambridge have actually spent quite a lot of money fundraising obviously not coming in from the government, to um, try to um, expand the financial aid uh, to students who otherwise would see this as too much of a barrier. And there's all these big campaigns at um, Oxbridge uh, colleagues, uh, colleges. Durham University, where I'm now the Chancellor, is starting to do this as well. St Andrews has a mixed system because Scottish students go for free under the mm. Scottish system, but they are now trying to expand out bursaries and hardship funds you know, for English students and others who might otherwise find it now difficult to go to St Andrews. But in uh, the United States, this is really key 
And the big state universities like Ohio State, uh, as well as the private uh, universities, all spend a lot of time trying to kind of think about how they can expand um, ad access to education and also to create bridging programs. Because I mentioned that the, um, the lecturer at, uh, at Oxford who um, interviewed me said I could probably do with an extra year, which was probably right, of educational bridging because of coming from a pretty straightened um, a comprehensive school. My A-levels were all over the place. I didn't actually use any of my A-levels <laughs> when I got to university because I couldn't really put together a, a, a basically a degree programme of the A-levels ended up taking because I just took the A-levels where there was a teacher mm -hmm. who could teach A-level. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> I, I'd wanted to do history, but the um, history uh, teacher resigned, or retired rather, the year before. And so I had to do art history, which actually, you know, it's, a bit, it's history, it's art. <laughs> uh, and there's lots of museums in County Durham. So I was actually able to get access to some amazing collections by cycling off to mm -hmm. various museums and, you know, kind of, uh, and there was courses at the museums as well that proved to be very helpful. I did geography, uh, which was kind of, we had a great geography uh, teacher mm -hmm. and she was absolutely amazing. Uh, and then I did English with this great English teacher I mentioned uh, before. And then I did French. And French proved a bit disastrous because my French teacher was stabbed with a compass, which I mentioned in the book. And needless to say, left the school and then nobody else wanted to come back to teach <laughs> French. And so I was ending up teaching myself French with those reel-to-reel, equité, -reel, uh, répété, you know, the whole time. And um, one French teacher suggested that I just read the Michelin Guide. Uh, to France uh, and just kind of get in the mood and I was like great that was kind of really lovely but I read all about Brittany and uh, later wrote a little essay in French about Brittany that I read about in the Michelin Guide so I suppose it came in vaguely useful but I mean this was actually kind of you know part of the problem so yes I did need a bridging program and in the St Andrews the Scottish system you get that extra year for um, students who've been doing hires but now places like Amherst, I think College was one of the first to do this, but Ohio State, Harvard's doing uh, bridging programs now. All of the, all of the um, colleges and universities in the United States are raising money uh, basically for these kinds of programs. So that's another way of addressing this issue of expanding opportunities, you know, making people less probable, helping people bring in, but it requires funding. And again, you know, there's more propensity for universities in some places to raise money through the private uh, sector or from foundations than there is for, you know, um, you know maybe um, other universities in you know, rather benighted parts of, uh, parts of Britain. And again, even in Germany, where it's funded by the state, there are these mm. charitable organisations and foundations that, uh, that do this um, uh, as well. Uh, when it comes to, um, you know, the 11 plus... Yes, actually, I do think that those kinds of um, you know, uh, rigid uh, selective exams should be done away with. You know, for a lot of people, they're late developers, right? I mean, I, I don't know how other people feel about it, but I know I did the 11 plus. My dad, you know, didn't get that chance to do it. I know a lot of people who got the 11 plus and ended up going off to a grammar school, in other words. But I also know a lot of people who weren't quite ready for the 11 plus or, or, and, and uh, these exams at that particular time. There were... And the people I met later who had been, you know, penalised and um, not, not get into a grammar school uh, because of the fact that, you know, it was only reading really their 13, 14, 15. People co basically come into their own at different stages in their lives, which is, again, why we should also be em emphasising continuing education, further education. You know, it might be that somebody in their 30s suddenly then realises what it was that they really wanted to do with themselves and get an opportunity to mm. continue their education and retrain. I don't think... And also, there's a lot of anxiety in, it, in um, examination taking as well. <coughs> there's a lot of, um, um, uh, basically now... Um, uh, analysis and data that shows that girls in particular have a lot of anxiety, particularly over subjects like math. Um, I, mean, I had general anxiety. I didn't necessarily have it over math. But I know a lot of people who do kind of, they see basically a math test and their brain just goes blank. And a lot of people have a hard time with the time tests. And if you think about it in life, there's not a lot of uh, time unless you're diffusing a bomb or some other, you know, kind of critical issue where you have to do things in a certain, you know, kind of rigid uh, time. I mean, there might be when, you know, you're a doctor and you're kind of racing against the clock for an operation. But most of our lives, you're not being asked to answer 20 questions in, you know, an hour and a half. It's, it's not a necessary... It's more of a a test of your ability, you know, to kind of overcome some anxiety rather than a kind of a, a test of, uh, of your skill. So I do think that uh, we should be uh, rethinking that and being, you know, a bit more um, circumspect. And also in the United States case, I mean, you do have the standardised tests, but there, there's actually now discussion of phasing them out <coughs> because there is an acknowledgement in the United States now that, you know, people coming from all kinds of different backgrounds, minority backgrounds, you know, rural backgrounds, 
uh, people have you know, different um, educational experiences and that we're really not giving people a chance by having a one-size-fits-all. Mm. And obviously race has um, a big um, impact in uh, the United Kingdom as well and gender and other issues, but place also plays a very important role. And I think as you're talking about Bridlington, there are the large parts of the United Kingdom that are not very diverse. I mean, in Scotland, it's kind of, what, 96% white? My hometown was 98%. It's kind of really a question of poverty and socioeconomic issues and the place itself. Now, that um, issue is, in the United States, often amplified because you have the racial um, underlay and overlay and additional barriers. And I think that what we have to be able to do is overcome all of those barriers at the same time. Gender, race, you know, ethnicity, language barriers and place and geographic barriers at the same time. It's not an either or. We have to figure out how we uh, tackle all of this um, at the same time. And I do think there are a lot of answers in the United States. Again, the public land grant universities in the United States, the big state universities, are actually very impressive. And perhaps you know, I might suggest a, a trip out to some of these places. I've been to a lot of them over mm. the last couple of years in researching the book and then since mm. then. And, and there's all kinds of different ways in which we can look at this. I mean, I know there was a fetish at one point for looking at Finland and mm -hmm. its educational yeah. system, but I think we could do a lot by looking at a combination of the United States, the UK. Again, it's our superpower, mm -hmm. and also Germany. And interestingly, the Germans are now looking at the British education system, which I was a bit surprised about, actually, <laughs> because apparently we've, we've done a lot over, over the years in creating more flexibility, perhaps doing more with less. And the Germans are worried now that their systems become too rigid, and in fact, getting back to the 11 plus question that they're streaming people too early and pushing people in different directions and not giving people an opportunity to come back. And the Germans aren't that great at adult education. They do a lot of retraining through their um, unions and their business um, councils, the workers' councils, but they don't have FE colleges and they don't also give people a chance to go back and, you know, retool and reskill. And so, you know, they're actually now looking at the United States and the UK as well. Okay, Bee's looking at me because you've got an online... And I'm giving, yes. I'm giving too long questions. Uh, we've, we've got, got people quite a lot to get through, so whilst you pick your next one, yeah. do keep your hands yeah. up. Two I'm just going to read out a question that's come the from online. I've got Janet. two in that row at the back. Janet Berenson asks, thank you for your insights. If you could implement through central government one single programme that could have the biggest impact, what might it be? Oh, wow, I think actually we should take a, a sea of hands here as well <laughs> for lots of experts here. Can I just audience. make sure the other two people get their microphones? Uh, yes, <coughs> and then lay Excuse me taking you halfway back into international politics, but yeah. uh, a question. Um, I, I chair a group which looks at the ethics of conflict, mm. which is currently engaged in a difficult subject, as you can imagine. And previously, we have found common ground between Christians and, and Islam on many of the principles about what is and is not an acceptable form of warfare. <coughs> to, today, I heard that MSc students at a college in university in London had said they were no longer able to write essays <laughs> about the situation in the Middle East because they found their backgrounds were inhibiting them from addressing the issue at all, like they'd come to a halt. So how could we find a way through education of bridging some of that understanding, which is clearly so missing in an important part of the world, which must have featured in your White House life? Yeah, very good question. Can we just pass the mic along the road? This, yes, yeah. And then we've got three questions, yeah. <laughs> You've got the intervention, the one intervention okay. that would... Yeah, I'm um, trying to think about that. I'm not sure if there would be one that would you know, fix everything, yeah. but yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think. But okay. actually, I think we should probably solicit from some okay. of the teachers Good. and uh, educators in the audience about what they would okay. think as well here. So what's going on in higher education with tricky political questions? <laughs> yeah, did you want to take another yeah. Oh, yeah. question as well? Okay. Yeah, okay. We're doing can it you, can well, you hear me? Yes, yeah. yes, we can. So I'm, yeah. I'm asking a question for the three of us here. Okay. We're, we're all long-term campaigners on education. And I think it's fair to say that we all feel that the debate generally for the last, I mean, from New Labour onwards in this country, has been about exceptionalism. Yeah. It's how do you get the talented from disadvantaged backgrounds to an Oxbridge College or whatever. Yeah. And you are a wonderful example of exceptionalism. Yeah. And your story, like all these stories, are always fantastic and interesting. But that doesn't seem to us to be the problem with the system. Yeah. The system is the forgotten third that Ask will talk about. 
who fail whatever tests the Tories have set up for them or New Labour before, those who fail the 11 plus in the selective counties who are written off at the age of 10, those who don't go to private school, we haven't mentioned private schools, but they are the big problem at the centre of all of this. Do you agree with any of that? <laughs> You have a lot, a well, lot to get into. These though. things are actually all you know, very much uh, tied together. And it was something that I was very mindful about in the book. I didn't call myself the improbable Fiona Hill. That was actually, FT, you know, it was yeah. FT. Yeah. But I did feel like, you know, I kept being asked about being a fluke. I was very conscious of that because, look, I went to school with people who were just as smart as I was. And I think that the difference for me was that my parents were really engaged in the idea of education because they felt that they hadn't had one in the way, well, my dad in particular, leaving school at 14, extremely interested in things, not having any opportunity, uh, and, you know, basically being written off right from the very beginning, but wanting to still have, you know, um, access to knowledge, and then finding it later through the Workers' Education Associations, the Jeremiah's Associations, just, you know, personal reading. My mum was always extraordinarily happy with her vocational training to be a nurse. When I asked my mum, would she ever do anything different, she never would. So there was somebody who was extremely pleased she hadn't she didn't pass uh, the 11 plus uh, in the top you know girls in her school to go to grammar school she was number four and only three girls got a place at the local um, grammar school where she grew up in Billingham and but she you know was actually unfazed by that because she loved being a nurse she was super proud of being one of the first midwives mm. in the, in the NHS so it's actually you know that um, there's different pathways you know to basically getting satisfaction out of your work and I don't think that the education system should be set up just with this pipeline. I mean, when I went to university back in 1984, uh, only 10% of uh, kids were going on to that kind of higher education at that point, of uh, polytechnics as it was then, and then universities. I mean, 90% of people were doing you know, something else. In fact, there was a very high uh, youth and employment problem in you know, the early 1980s as well. I mean, 90% of people weren't actually initially going on uh, to very much. It took them a long time to find vocational training. And I think that, you know, precisely what you're saying here, that we can't have a one-size-fits-all education system. And we have to really kind of think and also listen to people. I read some really good reports by one of the Youth Voice uh, UK, I think that's um, kind of one of the titles, about how people would actually like an education where they're given an opportunity to have practical training as well, to basically have work experience. I mean, I did get work experience all the way through because I had to work. I mean, I, I cleaned in uh, the hospital... Um, those were my connections, got me a great cleaning job. Uh, but I also worked in pubs and bars. I um, Eventually, when I was learning Russian, I did some translation. I worked in a call centre. I did all kinds of things. And I got a lot, enough work experience to know things I didn't want to do. <laughs> but I didn't get a lot of the work experience. I didn't have any fancy internships. Uh, I didn't have any of these kinds of opportunities. But I also then worked with an awful lot of people also <laughs> trying to find their way there as well and who would have loved to have different ways of fitting back into education to get some training. And I think that that's what we have to be thinking about as well. In the United States, there's a lot of thinking about public-private partnerships. In Germany, there's a lot of this as well. I personally think we have to reinvigorate the uh, labor unions again as well and uh, the workers' associations and invest a lot in workers' education associations. So I think we ought to be having a, 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 a conversation about this, not just nationally but internationally and looking at various things that work because I do not think it's of good for any society to be basically writing off vast swathes of your population. And we will not be competitive either in the UK or the United States in the international marketplace. That's not what the Chinese are doing. They're putting in uh, a lot of emphasis on education. The Germans are panicking about education right now. And they've actually got a whole programme of leaving nobody behind at all. You, might, you know, the United States had the head start and no child left behind. And they've you know, actually been failing a little bit at you know, uh, basically expanding all of this. But, you know, many other uh, countries are realising that having an educated population, not just an educated workforce, is going to be the absolute key to the future. Mm -hmm. So the critique that you've had there um, is, is, uh, is very well founded, and we need to be creative. Uh, and we need to be creative all the way along. We can't write anybody off at different parts of um, their lives either. I mean, you know, my dad, you know, losing his job in the mines in his 30s, um, you know, there's no opportunity okay. at that point to retrain. And he's always in his 30s. And I have friends and, and relatives who've lost their job in their 50s uh, and could retrain. My sister lives in Spain and got actually money to retrain um, after her um, uh, job folded under, uh, under COVID. So there's, you know, lots of places are actually, you know, investing in this and thinking, you know, that people can, you know, do various things. So maybe getting back to that question about the one <laughs> thing that intervention was be to thinking about education in a holistic 
fashion again as a continuing lifelong learning uh, and giving people the opportunity. I mean, I'm extraordinarily lucky that I work in a place like the Brookings Institution where I'm a senior fellow and I have the opportunity to learn things all the time. Mm. But, you know, we have institutions like City Lit where I was speaking last night. Uh, I actually talked to a couple of people here who are taking courses, the local um, technical colleges. Mm. You know, there's all kinds of things that we should be um, really investing in and um, trying, to, uh, trying to pump up. And I've missed uh, one of the one other question questions. One question was about the, with your foreign policy hat on, about why does that some students feel they're unable to deal with contemporary um, Look, I think we've effect, kind of got an atmosphere about... right now in higher educational establishments that we didn't have when we were there, when you had all kinds of open discussion. I mean, I must have had incredibly uncomfortable conversations while I was at university with people. And, you know, now we have a kind of a culture where everything is out on um, social media, where people get um, attacked for, you know, expressing uh, divergent views. Uh, you know, all the way, you know, back in um, school, I mean, I remember back, back in, um, you know, mostly in my elementary school, teachers encouraging us to take on hard questions. Uh, obviously, it's somewhere like Bishop Barrington at the time, we were kind of living a lot of the hard questions, so there wasn't really much of a debate about it. But it was one of the things that I really appreciated at St Andrews is meeting people who were not like me, uh, who would come up with divergent um, uh, points of view. And I think, you know, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's extraordinarily difficult under uh, the kind of current environment on college campuses here in the UK and in the United States to have just open debates uh, that are mediated, uh, you know, by people. Um, so this is, um, it's, it's happening more in civic organisations. I, I was also very interested in Germany at seeing how debates were being handled. It's um, more open debate actually there in the university. But they've got a lot of civic groups mm -hmm. that go out to uh, basically um, structure and shape uh, discussions. Uh, you, were, you were mentioning this from the religious perspective. In the United States, there are a lot of interfaith groups that actually still sit down you know, and talk about um, various uh, issues. There's, there's a number of them. I don't know actually how much they've been affected over the last um, few weeks by you know, all the tragedies in the Middle East. But definitely civic groups uh, can play um, a role as well. It doesn't just have to happen in universities. But I think you've just put your you know, finger there on a, on a major problem uh, where the educational environment was supposed to be expanding inquiry and you know, people you know, basically having to face up to the fact that you know, people don't always think like you and they have you know, different... Mm -hmm. uh, very different perspectives that you're going to have to deal with, you know, as you go on through your life. Okay, well, I'll take a quick round of final questions, Joe, at the back, and this lady in the front, two ladies in the front, if you can ask quick questions, chat there, and this lady here has had her hand up. Yeah, yeah, with a black scarf on, yeah. Okay, Joe. Thank, thank you very much, and thank you for a great talk, Fiona. My question is to you as a foreign policy practitioner, and whether you think the decline in the, the sorry, whether you think the decline in the teaching and learning of modern foreign languages is making it harder for us to understand how other countries see us, and also making it much more difficult for us to anticipate changes in countries such as Russia and China. Yes, <laughs> I think it is. Um, um, yeah. the other two? But anyway, I'll yeah, hold yeah, that thought. Yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah. but the. Shepard Hi, my name is Shazia Haya. I'm a, oh, an Sorry. Afghan yeah. journalist. Uh, I'm here because of uh, education. Um, there are million Afghan girls in Afghanistan that they have the same dreams like, like you. They want to read, they want to write, but they are not yeah. allowed to study. So what's your message for those girls? And also, related to Afghan girls' education, what's your message to the world? Thank you. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. yeah. We'll come. Okay. Uh, a couple of things. Th thank you very much for your talk as well. It's been fascinating. Um, I'm a teacher, maths, funnily enough. Um, and f first of all, I just wanted to touch on your point about exams. Um, I feel like we should be quite careful in dismissing them. We only have to look at what happened to private school grades over COVID to see quite how catastrophic that was uh, for a lot of students from, from underprivileged backgrounds. Um, secondly, is um, your point about broadening the... Uh, the sphere for what you can do in terms of education and at what points you can enter the workforce. Um, why do you think this has taken so long? Because I don't think this is a particularly new pheno phenomenon. I know when I graduated, right, there was still all this talk about these massive multinational companies doing entry from 18, even some from 16. Um, I look now and it's actually no better. In fact, it's worse. So what, what's been holding back all of, these, all of this goodwill? Because it, it clearly hasn't happened. Okay, thank you. Yeah. This lady here with the black scarf. Again, echoing everyone else's um, opinion of the great talk, thank you. 
Uh, I'm a transport planner, um, so Fantastic. I'm with you in terms of mobility, uh, but I'm also going back to university next year and I'm 50, so I'm, com I'm with you in terms of continuing education. But my question is, uh, my stepdaughter is at Oxford. Um, her best friend came from a comprehensive, and what really disappointed me was when I heard that she is going through, <coughs> she's going through uh, medicine, so obviously really difficult course to get onto. And she was told, so she's, she's got all the way through to Oxford and she's told, uh, if you don't understand how to answer the questions, that's kind of your problem. And I just wondered yeah. when you were, when you finally got to your fantastic university, did you have that issue in terms of trying to sort of adapt your knowledge and your education to the way in which this great institution had uh, decided that you needed to learn. Yeah. Okay. Really okay. We're going to have to be quite quick yeah. with these answers. So we've yeah. got a question about modern foreign languages limiting our understanding of other parts of the globe. We've got a question about yeah. Afghanistan, Afghanistan and the world more generally. A question about these other routes into education at 18, which seem to be narrowing rather than widening. Yeah, and, and then the kind of difficulty. Yeah. yeah. Look, I, I think uh, on languages, um, personally, I think everyone should um, maybe have some exposure in some fashion to modern languages. <laughs> Because, you know, it's no good just, um, you know, using, you know, Google Translate and, you know, getting the kind of the literal translation of something or Duolingo, um, as great as it may be. I actually was trying that in Germany to try to improve my German. I got very good at being able to go to a grill party, a barbecue, <laughs> but it wasn't really helping me to actually go out and have any of my professional meetings. So it's kind of, there are limitations here. Because, I mean, in, in learning a, um, a foreign language, it really does expand your mind. It's a bit like mathematics and, and music and all the other kinds of things that, you know, help you to um, broaden you know, your perspective on the world, but really to understand the context and the way that people think. And I have to say that you know, studying Russian was one of the best things that I ever did. And I did take advantage, you know, when I was at uh, St Andrews, of the opportunity to just go and take classes in another language for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. There was actually, you know, you could have these free language courses. I mean, again, you can you know, do that now too. And it really did help me on understanding the way that uh, people in other countries really thought about things because there's just the whole conceptualization of language and you realize a lot of things are lost in translation and I would actually really advocate that even though we're trying to put an emphasis on STEM people should take humanities courses and should have some exposure at least to um, a foreign language not you know I know it's easy now everyone speaks English English has become a tool it's really no longer a cultural signifier uh, but um, that's not an excuse anyway. Uh, in terms of Afghanistan um, and the world, uh, and you know, and the world, you know, at large, women's education, girls' education is so important. I mean, it's just an absolute tragedy what's happening in Afghanistan. I really wish that I personally could do something about it. It's amazing that you're here. I hope that you know we'll collectively be able to help you to be uh, an ambassador uh, for girls' education. And I think that all women and all people, you know, writ large, have to do their utmost to make it possible for girls uh, around the world and um, everybody you know at large to have access to education in some forms we have to be really creative about that and I think it's just fantastic though you're here and if there's any way that I think you know myself and anybody else here in the audience can help you you know kind of figure out your path forward and how to help you know people like yourself um, I hope that we will be able uh, to do that and I think it's also part of thinking about these other pathways into education it's a good question, why haven't we done this? I mean, in fact, if we go back to 1918 and 1919, and there's some of the first big reports that the British government did on education, there was already these ideas that we needed to have a well-educated population and adult population uh, as an antidote to demagogy. And um, that was kind of one of the lines in the, the 1919 adult education report. And here we are again at a time of demagogy, not just Donald Trump, you know, but this kind of post-truth environment that we're in. This was after the Bolshevik Revolution, getting back to the Russian idea again, when people were worried about the rise of totalitarian systems. And the best antidote to that was people being educated and having an ex access to an education around, you know, across their lives. Like, we have an opportunity now to certainly to, to rethink that. Mm. I think it is will, political will. Uh, I, I think it's often, you know, the Germans themselves, you know, were realising they thought that they were doing extraordinarily well for a long period of time, and now they're suddenly realising that their own social mobility is actually um, uh, grinding to a halt. 70% of Germans in some recent polls said that no matter how hard they worked, they couldn't see themselves getting ahead. And that is, you know, in a country that you think about having great educational opportunity. So it's a common problem. And I think now that we're um, uh, recognising that, you know, um, I'm actually been so surprised by how many people are writing about this right now. 
it's not just, uh, you know, you've been writing about this for a long time, but everyone is waking up to the fact that as educators here have known for a very long time that we do have an issue. Uh, private sector, the future of work, the whole debates about AI and where we're headed from now. This is the time to try to make a change. So we've got to basically start rallying uh, people together. And, and I think, um, you know, when uh, you talked about your uh, daughter's friend, yes, I did actually have a lot of those issues um, when I got to St Andrews. And again, I've got some friends from St Andrews here who actually helped me out at the time, all came from the same uh, background. I have to say that I was very lucky, and, you know, perhaps that's one of the reasons now that St Andrews is ranked so high as it is in the uh, university rankings. The professors actually um, took um, some care and attention. I actually found that there were people I could go and talk to uh, hidden behind the scenes there were often some, you know, lectures at the university that actually also come, they'd come through the grammar school system, but they'd come from, you know, more impoverished backgrounds and they understood and they actually did take the time if I went into their office hours. So, you know, what um, your uh, daughter's friend is hearing is obviously pretty dispiriting. But hopefully, and, you know, people like Tommy are here um, right now who uh, did go through the Oxbridge system, there might be some um, peer-to-peer -peer support groups or some actually, you know, really useful uh, faculty members who actually could uh, give some advice. And I think people are more mindful of that. Now, I think medicine is a particularly hard, uh, very hard discipline, as you said. You know, they're, they're, ex they're really pushing people, you know, very hard. So maybe, maybe outside of the medical faculty, there might be, you know, some assistance elsewhere. We do think to have to think about college counselling, more of these bridging groups, People are more aware of that, that there's not, again, one size uh, fits all. Mm -hmm. And often, you know, just having a linear path towards examinations or not understanding the questions. I often didn't understand the questions at all either because they're geared towards people with a different kind of cultural awareness. There's a kind of cultural capital that people have. Again, it's like that maze. And you don't know. I often didn't even know what terms meant. And, and, and I, it wasn't just I could look them up in the dictionary or use Google Translate for, you know, kind of something from another English term. I just simply didn't understand the context. Mm -hmm. And I would often have to have someone explain that to me. Because you have to code shift, you know, from different backgrounds. It's actually been, in a way, you are learning a foreign language uh, or a different kind of a different context, the way that people think. OK, well, we've just got one very quick... Quick, quick, quick. Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, yeah, I'm glad you brought up code switching because I was going to ask you, education is just one uh, step in the pipeline. Yeah. And in, um, say, the foreign policy world, IR world that you come from, uh, it's very elitist, very male, pale, stale. Um, uh, what can institutions, and we see in the UK with the cabinet being very, like, uh, in the past, Etonian, um, what can be done institutionally to ensure that people who go through the education system and take those great steps when they reach the um, great institutions that they actually stay, that they aren't turned off and they don't leave after a year or two because they don't know the codes, they don't get yeah. the support they need, mm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, there's some really good... Can I just, yeah, before I you say that, because we still come yeah. to, back to the question about how we get more Fiona Hills. <laughs> One minute. We've got one minute. So I think that is how we get more Fiona Hills is tied up to that, because how do people keep going, in a way, that you, in the way that you did? Yeah, because I do think it's like the dropping out, because there are people who do drop out um, on the way, because it's just too hard and just, um, you know, they're, they feel like they're on they the They get road. knocked back, by think. They do. And, and it's really setting up all of these uh, support mechanisms. And I think there's a bit of good news here is in, in the fact that actually the UK government in particular has woken up to the fact that there needs to be more diversity and they need to work harder at it. In fact, over the last few days I've been in London, I've been asked to speak to social and mobility networks in, inside the UK government. And I was actually kind of surprised to find that some of them have been in place for the last 10 years. It's just they've been going along in fits and starts because COVID you know, threw a lot of things off as well. But there's a real determination now to bring people in from different backgrounds, but you've got to start with schools. And I, I did uh, one um, event for the national security uh, <laughs> system, and I kept thinking, what are they going to explain to each other in schools about the different kinds of jobs that you could have? Because when I was in school, I had no idea that there were jobs like this. So you could be an engineer, you could be you know, in software, or in, in an IT, in a national security context, but you wouldn't know that those kinds of jobs are out there. So the key is... Um, basically linking into schools like my MP Derek Foster did when I was 13 or 14 coming in. But it's also what he did, and I mentioned that at the beginning, was follow up. His constituent office followed up. So I think actually, you know, when we do start to think about local government and MPs, maybe they just need to do some of the old fashioned, you know, kind of work of actually doing constituency work, which is not um, always that 
attractive to those who are parachuted in from somewhere else into the kind of the local area, but to kind of really engage with their constituents. It, it's not the case that Congress people do that very often in the United States, kind of thinking back to, do you know your local congressperson from Ohio? They're probably doing some kind of performative strange politics in Congress at the moment. I don't think Marjorie Taylor Greene is doing a lot of constituent work, you know, for example, not that she's from Ohio. But you really do need to have all these different, you know, kind of levels of interaction. And, and, uh, and, and follow up and support we're, we're its mentorship. Off, offline uh, now, aren't we? Well. So we're yeah. going to have to draw it to a close. B is waving at me. Yeah, B is giving us that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both so much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much.